Thank you very much. So as Annie just said, I'm Curtis, and I, I run a company called Fieldwork. Um, and at Fieldwork, we do a bunch of research stuff using ethnography and other research methods. Um, and we do that for companies that need some beginner's eyes and ears to see what's going on in their business. But today, my talk is mainly about my personal work, uh, my personal photography project called Beyond Work, and a lot of the stories I've uncovered. So this talk's called Something About Work because it's much more a bunch of questions than it is answers. I've been using this talk as a way to try and circle around the thinking I'm doing, around my ideas around work, the notion of work, and what it means to me and what it means to other people. So to do that, I'm going to share a couple of stories from my Beyond Work project, including one about a time that I got locked in a cage with one of the workers, and also a little bit of history about where my interest in work has come from. I'm also going to reference a few things across my talk, but to save you writing stuff down, I've created a reference page for you to look up at the end of my talk. So before we go any further, I would like to ask you all to relax your shoulders, take a deep breath, and close your eyes. And you should know when to open them. When we get ready for bed and set our alarm clocks for the next day, the laws of time are the same for all of us. We're about to sleep whilst the clock next to us waits, its cogs or binary numbers shifting, preparing itself to wake us from our dreams and warm beds. In another part of the world, clocks and phones, just like the ones next to our sleeping heads, are rolling along conveyor belts, being put together by some other working humans. Then the alarm clock goes off and it's time to open your eyes. So when I wake up, it's often minutes before my alarm clock's going off. Um, I guess my body's just got used to being awake at a particular time. I don't normally feel relaxed at this point. If it's not a running morning, which it was this morning, weirdly, um, I, I've got into the bad habit of grabbing my phone and looking on Twitter and Instagram and all the other things that I, I do to avoid sitting up, swiveling around, and placing my feet on planet Earth. By the time I've got my feet on planet Earth, I'll normally have a mix of enthusiasm and apprehension about my day. I'll be wondering what my day will hold for me. Will I find fulfillment? Will I find kindness in the people I encounter? Most importantly, I'll be wondering whether or not I'll get all that shit I've got to do in my calendar done by the end of the day. Um, and I was intrigued. I wonder what other people felt at this moment in time, and so I asked them. When I hear my alarm clock go off, I'm thinking, how can my alarm clock go off? I've just gone to sleep. And then I'm thinking, how quickly can I get to the coffee? Generally, oh, come on. <laughs> like, really? It's 5.30? Generally, I'm thinking, like, I wish I could just stay in bed a bit longer and get up when I want to get up. It's the when you get woken up by, Wah! you know, you think, oh, God, you've got to get suddenly, like, you know, be wrenched out of your warm bed and go stand yeah. in her room. And, yeah, that's not very fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So normally I'm wanting more sleep, I think, is the answer. When my alarm goes off in the morning, I'm normally thinking, can I put it on snooze? I make that decision based on what I'm teaching first lesson. If I have a meeting or if I'm not going to be teaching until 8.35, have I got all my resources ready yet? Do I need to make anything? Do I have to queue at the photocopying machine? And all of those decisions I have to make before I even press the snooze button. This morning, I, I had a slightly late to start, so I didn't need to get up until about half six. And I had the alarm set, but actually, because my body clock's on five o'clock, I felt like I was having the most amazing lion. So no matter where we are on this planet, we'll all have 24 hours or 1,440 minutes in our day. Some of how we spend that time will feel very different, and some of it will feel very similar. Some of us will spend a bit of that time sleeping, resting, playing, eating. Some of us will be the masters of our own time, and some of us won't. Most of us will work for some of that time, and in the UK, the working population amounts to 38 million people. And I'm really interested in those bits of time that connect to work, and to kind of give you an idea as to why, I need to go back four years or so. So four years ago, I found this book in a charity bookshop in Lincoln. It's by a guy called Ronald Fraser, and it's a fantastic collection of 20 essays from different workers from the 60s. And it's, it's really, really inspiring. It's a really inspiring read. You can still get it for about 50 pence on Amazon. And it has this fantastic um, introduction. We talk shop, yet we rarely say what we intimately feel about work. We spend the greater part of our lives working, yet we rarely find time to think what our jobs mean to us. 
The repression is curious, as though a vital sector of our lives were incommunicable, or perhaps not worth communicating. And yet work, the capacity of acting humanely on the world, is a shared experience. For the majority of us, it is done in common with others. For every one of us, it is done, however privately, for others. So this book inspired me to want to create a photographic version of, of, of these stories about working life. And around the same time as finding that book, uh, a good friend of mine was running a thing that he called a publisher-thon in his studio. Um, he basically opened up his design studio to let anyone come in and make zines. So I'm sure you've all heard of what zines are. They're basically a very simple magazine that you can make with a photocopy machine and a stapler. And so I decided to take a week off my day job to document a whole bunch of other people whilst they worked. And so I set about finding some people, and I decided to document a kind of general office worker, a guy that works in a kind of strategy company, a graphic designer, and a guy that runs a natural history museum. And I spent each morning with them, basically just shadowing them as they arrived at work, and then they did their thing. I photographed them, I interviewed them, and observed as they worked. I then rushed back to the studio, developed the two rolls of film that I'd limited myself to using uh, whilst I was photographing, scanned the negatives in, laid out the books, hand-bound them, and by Friday, I'd made three zines. Um, and over that time, I'd also had plenty of time to think about what this project could become and what it meant to me, but I'd also come up with a whole load of questions like these. How do we define work? How does it fit in with the rest of our lives? Is it something we do or is it something we are? How do we make it more fulfilling? Is it important to love what we do? What happens if and when the robots take over? Will work ever be equal for men and women? What's a hobby and what's a side project? Does purpose matter? Does money make us work harder? What's it like to have no security in a job? or to work for a job for 40 years just for money? What's it like to be jobless or workless and is being out of work lazy? What's the opposite of work? Is being a parent work? Is work good or bad? And I've discovered over the years that one of the most important questions for me is how do we end up doing what we're doing? And that comes back to something very personal to me and I think is probably at the heart of Beyond Work, the project. It comes back to me wondering how I've come from a small post-war council estate on the outskirts of Brighton, leaving school age 16 with zero qualifications, going straight into the world of work, and yet I seem to have over the last 20 or so years done work and been in jobs that I've found fulfilling or interesting. I've had jobs that I've hated, but on the whole I've really enjoyed my work, and it makes me wonder what tiny moments, luck, people, chance or skills have I had in my life that have brought me to this time? What examples of work did I grow up with that have influenced what I've ended up doing? It also makes me think what the future holds for my own work. Now we seem to live in a more precarious age of work. And it feels to me like this is a very important question to try and answer at the moment, as we head into what to me feels like a new kind of capitalism. And I'm wishfully and probably naively thinking it's going to be a more conscious one, but the actions or consequences of certain companies don't give me much hope, and Sports Direct is one of those companies. But whatever happens, the future of work is going to look and feel very different. And that begs another question. What conditions are needed to nurture and support people for a life at work and beyond work? So attempt to get a little bit closer to some answers to some of those questions, I spent the past four years documenting various people at work, and I'd like to share two stories from two of those people with you. So first up, Gavin. And a few hours before meeting Gavin for work at six the following morning, we'd spent the evening talking about his photographic work in the same house that he'd lived in for 26 years, in a place called Brig House in West Yorkshire, nestled between Leeds, Halifax, Bradford and Huddersfield. Gavin describes it as his hometown. As we sit looking through the photographs, he tells me about his days off. I don't mind my job, it's just something I do. I just keep on getting up and going to work. But when you're not working a day, it's, it, it is special. Just the freedom is to do what you want. You want to use the time as much as you, you can. We need rest days because like my job is very physical and uh, I do need my weeks off just to recover. 
He told me about his first experience with a camera at a safari park when he was a teenager and how it led on to him finding confidence in his work that he hadn't been able to find in more academic subjects. Gavin ended up at Trent Polytechnic doing a diploma in creative photography. And as we leafed through the photographs in the old leather case, I found a copy of the British Journal of Photography in it. And in there, there was a feature about up-and-coming photographers, and Gavin was featured. I remember taking my work to... Um, there was a, a gallery in um, Nottingham in the Lace Market, and uh, that was a place where everybody exhibited the work. You know, it was a big sort of place in the centre of Nottingham. And I remember going for an interview there, and uh, I had my leather suitcase just rammed full of prints. Oh, oh, and I took my editor so I could show them a short film that I'd made. So after leaving Trent Polly, Gavin said he couldn't remember doing any actual professional commercial photography work. He carried on doing it as a hobby, um, despite always seeing it as more than a hobby. He always felt that when you're educated in something, you're something special, and he was really proud of getting a 2-1 in his diploma. But Gavin ended up moving back to Yorkshire with his girlfriend, who was working in Bradford at the time. I very quickly got a job on the, on the dustbins. I'd done the job as a student before I went to uh, Nottingham, just as casual labour, and uh, also to make enough money to, to buy my, uh, my Nikon. I've worked there at, uh, on the bins now for about 27 years. So that was back in 1988, and Gavin's been a refuge collector in Halifax since then. So after meeting Gavin at home at 6 o'clock the following morning, we drove the 15-minute journey to the main depot in Halifax. It had snowed the day before, and that was Boxing Day. And there was a chance we might not head out because of ice on the roads. But after a bit of waiting around at the depot, we headed out. I put my high-vis vest on, which I seem to be wearing a lot of these days, and we headed out onto the icy streets of Halifax to collect the Christmas rubbish. I asked Gavin what it felt like to be on his feet outside all day, and this is what he said. I think all of us enjoy working outside. Most people have done a factory job where you're just watching the clock all day. There's none of that on the bins. You've got a task and uh, you just get on with it. You Quite often you're oblivious to the time, unless time's running out and you, you, you were wishing in a way there was a bit more time so you could get the task finished. So time comes up a lot when I talk to people about work. Most people tell me they don't have enough time to do their work. A lot of people tell me that they're wishing time away and just looking forward to home time. And Gavin told me that what he wanted was more time for the stuff outside of work. Top of his list were still photography and learning to play the saxophone. And he told me that his main priority or ambition in life is to have his own exhibition of his work. So I'm really interested in how workers think they're perceived by other people. And I asked Gavin what he thought society felt about his work. Children, obviously, it's a very smelly job. They'll all walk by holding their noses or complain about the smell. When they look at us, we're probably quite low down on the scale of jobs as far as uh, the bins is probably near the bottom. You know, whereas a doctor would be near the top sort of thing. I would advise children to do very well at school so they don't have to become a bin man, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I would say it was a good life. I would say to them, well, I've been doing it 27 years, so it can't be that bad. I think society sees it as a very necessary thing. They've got a problem. They've got a load of rubbish that they want clearing each, each week. So we're doing a very ne necessary job. We used to just collect everything from every house and there was never any problem but you know with restrictions on re recyclable waste and what side waste you, you shouldn't should or shouldn't be taking it we're not the most popular of people really now I don't think we don't have a particularly good relationship with the public whereas before I think they they just see us as hard-working blokes that took all the rubbish now it's a little bit like sort of the bin police. So unlike a lot of refuge collection that um, is gradually moving towards communal bins and automation, Gavin's realm requires a lot of door-to-door -door, um, collection. Um, and as we continued that collection, it felt like Gavin had a good connection to the, the kind of community that he was working in. 
It was Christmas, and there was a load of Christmas cards in the wagon and Christmas gifts, and he told me that they get a lot of tips over Christmas, although he said it's gradually declining over the years. So after hours in the freezing cold, we headed back to the depot to dump the wagon full of rubbish. And I met the depot manager, who excitedly show, showed me around the depot, giving me a tour. He told me all sorts of facts about recycling. And the one he was most excited about was them, being, them recycling over 60% of their rubbish and being at number eight in the UK league table for recycling. And I wonder if anyone here knows where Bournemouth might be on that league table. So it's out of 352. So Halifax are doing quite well. Any guesses where Bournemouth might be? Okay, well, it's actually not doing too badly. It's 85 out of 352. And Brighton, my hometown, with its green MP, and up until recently, its green council, where do you think that might be? 338, right near the bottom. I know, don't start me off. <laughs> so it was hard not to think about all the work that had gone into creating all this rubbish. Um, and just how much stuff there was wasted in the world. As I watched these wagons dump their post-Christmas wrapping papers and boxes and Christmas, uh, turkey carcasses and Brussels, treat, Brussels sprout trees, yeah, that was the word. 60% um, of it was heading for recycling, but too much of it was still heading, heading for landfill. Whenever I speak with Gavin now, he tells me about a new photo project that he's working on. He's always got some new experiments in photography to show me. I found out a couple of weeks ago that he's just had his first exhibition commissioned at the Dean Cloth Mill in Halifax. And you remember I said earlier that was one of his life ambitions, and so you can imagine he's very excited about this. It seems clear to me that Gavin's definition of work has clear boundaries, clocking in, working hard, and possibly a sense of pride in that work. But does he do it just for money? Yeah, I think he does do it just for money. I can't imagine him doing that job if he had another way to support himself. But once he clocks out, that's his time. That's his time to spend with his family or to rest or to work on one of the projects that does fulfill him. And Gavin's really happy. Despite having a job that he describes as being, in his own words, near the bottom of the list of jobs, and I think that's possibly because he doesn't define his whole self with his work. So that was Gavin, photographer and bin man. Now on to another worker. So this is Andrew's clock. You can just about see it's 5.15 in the morning. I always pick people that get up really early in the morning. But this is 30 minutes after Andy got up, as he did six days a year, six days a week for 37 years before retiring. I met Andy in his flat near Seven Dials in the centre of Brighton. And it was a chilly, dark October morning, and I guess most people were sleeping. I watch as he gets ready and eats his cereal at his computer table, knowing we'll be leaving before long. Andy was a postman, or to give him his official title, an indoor postal worker. And postal work was something of tradition in Andy's family. His dad was one, first in Watford, then in Brighton. Two of his uncles were postmen, his brother and a cousin were all postmen. And when I photographed him, he was in his 65th year of life and ready to retire. I imagine that the early mornings were pretty tough on him, and he was really looking forward to that retirement. As he walked the 15-minute route to work, I asked Andy about the journey and what it was like, and he told me a story about someone being mugged on the street we were walking down, and all of a sudden, my senses were heightened. We arrived at work, and Andy went straight to the locker room, and I was surprised by its emptiness. There were plenty of lockers, just no other people other than Andy, and it made me feel like the place was a ghost town. The emails, Facebook, Snapchat, and WhatsApp had stolen these lockers of people and their belongings. I didn't have that long to dwell on the life of lockers, though, as Andy was straight into work after hanging up his coat, and this is him signing in for the day. And as we walked the corridors, I asked him what he thought other people thought about the work that he did and the post office, and this is what he had to say. I suppose look, most people value the postman since it's been privatised, whether that was, you know, people will value you as much as, you, uh, as they did before, I don't know, but... Um, over the, I think over the last few years, a lot of changes have been made and people are receiving their mail later now. You know, I don't think they value it as much as they used to. So Andy's had many roles over the past 37 years, but the one he's done for the last few years has seen him spending his days in a room called The Cage. The Cage is eight metres square, has one small hatch looking out to the sorting room office and is entered by a double door system. Only one can be open at a time. 
I was told by head office in London not to photograph anything to do with security, especially in this room. Fortunately, the local manager was a lot more relaxed and let me photograph whatever I wanted. <laughs> I asked Andy about his ideas about work, and I was struck by an acceptance that work for him was just a means to an end. And before I go any further, I need to say I'm not one of those types that thinks you need to be happy all the time and love your work. I accept there are some people that don't need to associate their whole being with what they do for work, and likewise, having meaning in work is really important for others, and I respect both of those. The most important thing is I don't think there's any reason why both of those types and everyone in between can't be treated like humans and find some fulfillment in their work. This is what Andy had to say. Well, I suppose it's, uh, work is, is something that you need to do to earn the money to live. That's the way I've looked upon it all my life. I presume my parents did as well. You need to go to work to pay your rent, to buy food, etc. It's a means to an end, isn't it? It's, uh, unless you're lucky enough to do work that you enjoy doing, there's not, not necessarily a chore. Yeah, it's a means to an end, isn't it? So I'd suggest that those words have plenty of resonance with the majority of workers in the world. Um, it's also interesting to get just a hint at what his parents might have thought about work and how that influenced him. Break times were spent getting a coffee from the machine, which is normally empty on a Monday morning after the weekend workers have drunk it dry. We head upstairs and end up sitting in a pretty run-down cafe, which looked like it could seat a hundred people. Yet Andy was alone, apart from some catering staff that were hanging around, looking like they wished they had some people to serve, if only to make time go faster. One of the things I enjoyed about spending time with Andy was the camaraderie that had built up over the years. It felt like Andy had built up some really strong bonds with the people that he worked with. Despite the confines of the cage, Andy had plenty of banter with the people that came up to collect that day's special delivery items. When I asked him about this, he said it was the only thing he'd miss about the job, which he described as not particularly demanding, a chore, and something you go in, you do, you come home, you get up, and you do it the next day. And he's had another important role over the last 40 or so years. He's also been my dad. And spending that time with him in that eight meter square cage reminded me of being in my teens and never seeing him and hating him for that. I realized the sense of duty work was to him and how hard he'd worked and how invisible that had been to me. It made me realize even more just how invisible most work is to other people. And to see this in his last, year, last month of work after 37 years was both moving and a bit heartbreaking. I lost a lot of my dad to that job, as he did with his dad, and lots of other workers around the world who only have Sundays or very limited time off. And I'd like to think we could get better at supporting humans in their whole lives so kids, partners, husbands and wives don't lose each other to work. Without my dad doing that job, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now, despite there being a time where he really wanted me to follow in the family footsteps and get a job at the post office. Even though he didn't really understand what I wanted to do for work, he was always supportive in his own way. And going back to what I was saying about people that inspire us and affect what we end up doing, on those rare times we did spend together, my dad played a lot of music in our flat, and he had a good collection of records, and some of those I really liked. And I'd say he had a pretty big influence on the thing I spent the first 19 years of my life working on, which is music and sound. And I'm hoping he's proud of that. Now, this story has a really happy ending. After those 37 years, my dad received early retirement. And this is him at his leaving party with some of his friends. And when I interviewed him, he talked about maybe getting a small part-time job to kind of, uh, you know, give him a little bit more money because of his pension not being very much. But he hasn't had to do that. And one of the lovely few benefits of working for the post office for that long is that they have a bunch of not-for-profit blocks of flats that they allow retirees to, to rent out super cheap. And he got on the waiting list, and a few months after retiring, he was given a place. And I'm really happy to report that this post office building is not an eight-meter square cage with just a small hatch to look out of. And now my dad spends his days walking, watching cricket, meeting his friends, drinking beer, and I'm really happy for him. It seems like a fitting and deserved end to 37 years of toil at the post office. So those are just a couple of stories from my Beyond Work project. There's also a bunch of zines, which I brought just a few copies of that I've made for each person. You can have a look at those later. Um, and I'm also working with a whole bunch of new people as well. So at the moment, I'm working with a working-slash-stay-at-home mum. 
um, called Stephanie, and that one's coming out kind of over the next couple of months. I'm working with an accountant and a guy that runs a, an amazing church project in Brighton. Um, and, and the church thing's really interesting. Underneath this umbrella of the church are a whole load of projects that they're not religious in any way, they're just about actually helping people, and, and there's some lovely stuff going on there. Um, and I'm always looking for new people. And someone that's at the top of my list at the moment is someone that's actually unemployed and having to deal with a job center. I'm fascinated by how people are supported when it comes to needing or finding work. And I've got a feeling and a gut feeling and a hunch that the job center don't do a particularly good job of that. So if you know of someone in that position, tell me afterwards. So I'm actually documenting someone's life at the moment that some of you might recognize. It's a work in progress, but I thought it would be good to share some of it with you today, and Andy, I hope you don't mind. So this is Andy Swan at work around 4.30 in the afternoon. I'd agreed to meet him to try and get an idea of what his commute was like, and to document a little of his working life, which I've still got lots more to do. We leave the office at 4.50, and I walk, we walk from BDG, which is where Andy works, to Waterloo Platform 11 to get the 1720 train to Tisbury. Andy's got a set route to and from Waterloo, along the river, cutting in to avoid crowds in the afternoon, walking the river route when it's nice and quiet in the mornings. We arrive at the station with 10 minutes to spare, and we walk to the end of the train. Andy likes this part of the train, because it's always quiet and there's a table to work on. By 6.20, we're traveling through countryside. The train feels fairly relaxed, there's plenty of empty seats. Andy busies himself in his iPad Pro, telling me about connection black spots and the potential for lost work. Four minutes later, the connection drops, and Andy's heart rate goes up a little. I'd hooked him up to a heart rate monitor because I wanted to measure his stress levels on his commute. After arriving in Tisbury, we drove a 20-minute journey home, stopping at the co-op for some wine to go with dinner. And we drive through some beautiful villages and see some amazing views. We arrive at his home at 7.30, almost three hours after we leave the South Bank. I'm greeted by his children, all excited to see this strange man who's coming to stay and photograph their dad. Grace shows me her guinea pigs. The others show me various games, paintings, and toys. I chat with Sarah and his wife in their dining room, which doubles as her painting studio. There's a mix of finished and half-finished portraits on the wall, along with some new experiments in landscape work. As we chat, I get called to the boys' bedroom. They want me to take a photograph of their dad, reading them a story. It takes a little while to get all four children to bed, and I chat with Sarah whilst Andy does some of this, and then Sarah goes to tame them. We eat, drink red wine, and chat over dinner. Andy talks a little bit about projects he's attempted to make happen, and they both talk about how they've moved home so many times over the recent years. But by about 10, we're all getting sleepy. We decide to go to bed. Jean has given me his room, and I settle down for the night in a slightly smaller bed than I'm used to. I set my alarm for 5 a.m. the next morning. I awake at 5 and hear Andy in the distance having a shower. I decide to forego my shower until I get home. I walk into the kitchen 20 minutes later, and Andy's there looking on his phone. He kindly makes me a cup of tea and continues on his phone. Neither of us are in the mood for breakfast at this time of the morning. We, drive, we leave at 6, driving to Salisbury. It's a 30-minute drive through beautiful countryside, and Andy says the view makes it all worthwhile, and I can see why. We drive through mist-covered valleys, tiny villages with beautiful churches, all nestled beneath roaming hills to the south. And the view of the largest cathedral in the UK tells me we're nearing Salisbury. We wait on the platform for 15 minutes before seven carriages arrive. Over those 15 minutes, people start to congregate on the platform. They're mainly wearing suits with long overcoats. Despite it being mid-April and sunny, it's a nippy three degrees. At 6.44 and 30 seconds, the platform guard raises his signal and blows his whistle. And he's on his way to the next stage of his journey to work. He doesn't work as much as he did on the evening commute the night before. This seems like quite a stressful time for him. He says he's feeling tired, low, and a bit run down. He's working long days and says that if he keeps it up, he'll get properly ill. He talks about ebbs and flow and how he has to keep an eye on his well-being and health. And his day-to-day -day has been planned around this, having a co-working day away from the BDG office as a way to find some calm and a different kind of focus. We begin to pull into, pull into Waterloo at 10 past 8. The sky remains blue with a few wispy clouds, and Waterloo is busy, as expected. We walk to BDG along the South Bank, and he tells me that he enjoys this part of the journey, despite it being over two hours since we left home. 
And that's Andy having a little bit of a view of the Thames there. And once we get to the office, we head straight upstairs. Andy goes to his locker, grabs his IBM ThinkPad, and finds a space to sit on the large center table. And whilst his laptop starts up, he goes in search of a cup of tea. So that's a really rough beginning of me documenting Andy's working life, but I thought it would be lovely to share that with you, seeing as none of us would be here today if it wasn't for the amazing work that Andy's put into to making this stuff happen. So as I mentioned earlier, my day job involves gathering these kinds of stories for companies, and we're currently working on an ethnographic research project for the organic food company Abel & Coal. We're studying working life and culture there, getting under the skin of the company in a way that they've never done before. They've been going for 29 years, so they've been around for a while. And like many other companies, they realize the importance culture plays on the success of their business. And they also recognize the importance of having some independent beginners' eyes and ears come and do this work. So we spent the last two or three months immersing ourselves in all of the different working lives in these companies. So we've traveled across the country in Arctic lorries, spent nights with shift workers, rushed across industrial estates to witness deliveries of tons of potatoes, taken part in taste tests, and listened in as the board of directors have their monthly board meeting. And this is Tom, one of our anthropologists um, on the picking line in Andover, observing and interviewing people as they work. We've also invited 50 Abel and Cole workers to become ethnographers themselves. Um, we designed a DIY ethnography kit, um, and that includes a, a notebook with a whole bunch of prompts and questions to get people studying their own lives, and a disposable camera that enables them to then spend that week photographing and capturing, capturing their stories. And we feel that it's really important to do stuff like that. An important part of ethnography is that you treat the people you're studying as collaborators, not as subjects just to watch. And so this has become a really important part of the way that we do this stuff. And last week, we shared some of our findings with some of the workers in a couple of the locations in uh, Abel and Cole, and they've got 11 different offices across the country. Um, we invited them to take a lot of the stories and quotes and stuff that we'd found, and we invited them to create an exhibition out of that stuff and add their own captions. So they were kind of helping us to see whether or not we're heading down the right path or not. They were challenging some of the things that we've discovered and giving us a whole load of more stories for us to use. And interestingly, this work we're doing is happening alongside their more traditional employee survey. And I'm really intrigued to see how our work differs from their more quantitative uh, data. And the final stage of our work will involve creating a practical and useful guide to the current status of working life and culture at the company. And I'm really excited to see what they do with that. So as I get to the end of my talk and the workers in these photographs start heading home after a long day, it's important for me to say that I'm interested in action or change happening because of my work, even if it's in a small way. One of the reasons I started Beyond Work and Field Work was to shine a light on the world of work. The invisible work heroes, the people that keep some of our infrastructure going, the people who work in jobs that some might call boring or horrible, but are a complete necessity. We all interact with other workers, whether it's directly or not. Travelling to work, getting our shopping, speaking with someone at a call centre, or sitting in a nice clean office all require work and labour. Some of us are in a position of power over other workers and can make decisions about their lives. All of us are in a position to change the way we interact with other workers. There's big things that can be done by companies and government, and small things that can be done by all of us, like the way we treat that train station worker the next time our train's delayed. And pretty much everything I'm doing right now connects to me wanting to humanise work by gathering and sharing these kinds of stories. Imagine how different the future of work could be if we were all able to share even more of our work stories so that everyone from the current to the future generations of workers can learn from those stories. I really hope I've made you ask some of your own questions about your work and all those other workers that touch your life in some way. And if you have any answers to some of the questions that I've mentioned earlier, please come and find me because I'd love to hear them and have a chat with you. Thank you all for listening.